Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Amanda Marcotte. My guest today is Andrew Jans. He is the Democrat running in California 22, which is the Fresno district. Um, he's running against Devin Nunes, who is the Republican incumbent. Welcome to Salon Talks, Andrew. Uh, hi, thanks for having me on today. So, Andrew, you're the deputy district attorney in Fresno working for the Violent Crimes Unit. Um, how do you think this experience will help you serve as a representative in Congress? Look, I've dedicated my adult professional life to the community. And as a prosecutor, I am tasked with pursuing truth and justice and also keeping uh, the community safe. And so I think that I've been pretty well prepared in that I'm out in the community every single day uh, working for victims of some of the most horrific crimes. I see a lot of the needs of the community and then also having grown up here in the district, uh, having attended public schools, uh, I think that I have a great take on things and a fresh perspective. You know, my opponent has been in Washington for nearly two decades and has accomplished little or nothing for the Central Valley and the district in particular. So I think the voters here are ready for a change and I think that my background as a law enforcement official prepares me well. California has really been at the center of a fight over immigration between the state and the federal government under Donald Trump. Fresno has gotten caught up in this fight with many on the right accusing the city of being a sanctuary city because local law enforcement doesn't harass people who haven't committed crimes about their immigration status. What's your view on local law enforcement and how they should deal with this issue of immigration and undocumented people living in the community? You know, this is a tough issue for us here locally. I think that the immigration issue and, and the debate around the issue impacts our region more so than maybe other regions around the country. And I can tell you that I just had a conversation today with a fellow deputy district attorney who was telling me that one of his victims in one of his cases is fearful of coming forward to court to press charges and testify against a person who uh, committed the crime against him. And he's unwilling to come forward because he's afraid of deportation. He has a clean criminal record, but our office can no longer guarantee that he won't be deported if he comes forward and testifies. And I don't think this keeps anybody safe, and it definitely doesn't help us pursue truth and justice. And so I want to make sure that if I go to Congress, that I'm going to work in a bipartisan fashion, not only to keep our country safe, but at the same time, make sure that families aren't being separated and people that are living here, um, paying taxes, many of which have uh, many of whom have served in the armed forces. Um, you know, I want to make sure that there's a pathway to citizenship for these folks. And I think that uh, if you look at the polling, most Americans agree with this. And so I think that we can come together on this issue and make sure that uh, we can at the same time keep the community safe, but also make sure that uh, folks aren't being deported uh, needlessly. Uh, and then another issue is, is the issue of uh, a labor workforce for our growers here in the Central Valley. You know, we have many farmers here that really depend on migrant on a migrant workforce, and that's been put in jeopardy over the last couple of years with these new policies that are coming down from Washington. And so the growers that I talk to really want to make sure that there's a solution for all parties involved, uh, including the people that go out there and work every every single day very hard to pick the produce that really free, uh, feeds America. I want to make sure there's a solution for everybody, and I want to make sure that that folks in Washington really pay attention to this issue. California has also been at the center of some environmental debates, especially around the issue of water, the water drought, wildfires, things like that. How do you propose dealing with some of these pressing issues if you get into Congress? You know, I think as a starting point, we need to make sure that the mis mis misinformation that's coming out of the White House stops. I don't think that it's doing anybody a service here in the Central Valley. And absolutely, we are being impacted by things like climate change. You know, I tell the farmers that uh, grow crops here in the Central Valley that the biggest form of water storage, water storage which is what they've been pushing for and what I've been talking about as well. The biggest form of and best form of water storage is the snowpack from the Sierra Nevadas. And we're not going to have a snowpack if we don't begin to address the issue of climate change. And so I want to make sure that we take this serious, this issue seriously. I want to make sure that other lawmakers take this issue seriously because I think that if we don't, we're going to have uh, extreme drought here in the Central Valley. We've been in a six or seven year drought. We're barely coming out of it. And so we want to make sure that we continue along this path. I think we need to do things nationally and globally like staying in the Paris Climate Accord. I think it was a huge mistake for the Trump administration to walk away from this deal. 
I'm just thankful that California stayed uh, as a uh, as a signator of this um, treaty. And so environmental issues are very important, especially with what you had mentioned with respect to the wildfires. You know, the dry the dry weather and the dry climate isn't helping us. And so we got to make sure that we have solutions in place that will work for everybody. So you're part of a, gr a growing group of Democrats that have pledged to reject corporate PAC money during this campaign season. In your view, why does campaign finance system need reform and why do you think rejecting corporate PAC money in the meantime is a, a useful strategy? You know, when I first got into this race, uh, people were telling me that I was crazy not to take uh, corporate money uh, because essentially everybody does it. Uh, for me, I wanted to make sure that I set an example for other people that are running for Congress. And I've been able to raise large sums of money at a very small average contribution rate of about $19. My opponent uh, takes money from the biggest corporations on the planet, Chevron, Verizon, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, Facebook, uh, FedEx, you name it. I mean, he's controlled and owned by these corporations. And so I don't want to go to Washington with all of this baggage, having uh, the feeling that I need to somehow repay my debts. Uh, I want to be owned by the voters of my district. And so for me, it was very important to take the pledge to say that I'm not going to take money from these types of special interest groups, because if you do, you're going to be owned by them by the end of the day. Uh, and we see this in, in my opponent, in Devin Nunes, and he's raised more money than anybody else on the Republican side running for Congress this year. And we see it in his votes, uh, his votes for tax breaks for corporation and, and billionaires and, and millionaires. He's not working for us. He's working for them. And so when I talk about this issue, especially in my district, Republicans and Democrats agree that there is too much corporate influence in Washington and it needs to end. And so there's no better way for me to begin to end the corporate influence in Washington than by setting an example for others who are running across the country. Well, speaking of your opponent, Devin Nunes, uh, he's been under a cloud of accusations of pretty serious corruption in the past couple of years. He's the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and he's supposed to be investigating Donald Trump's ties to the Russian spy networks. But it seems he's more interested in protecting Trump from such an investigation. Now there's an audio tape out where he says, quote, if Sessions won't unrecuse and Mueller won't clear the president, we're the only ones i.e. the only ones that can shield Trump. That seems to be what he was saying. Uh, so I want to hear your thoughts on this Russian scandal and, and Nunes' role in it. Look, this investigation into the Russian meddling in 2016 is going to be one of the most important investigations ever undertaken in the United States of America. So we need to make sure as a country that this investigation continues unimpeded and that we put politics aside you know, traditionally in the House Intelligence Committee, Republicans and Democrats have been able to come together in a bipartisan fashion to make sure that our country is protected. Uh, we see the Senate Intelligence Committee working just fine and supporting the findings of many of our um, friends in the intelligence community and saying that the Russians did meddle. And so I see my opponent every single day in Washington working to really undermine this investigation. And what's most frustrating about all of this is that he is using his position as committee chairman to not only interfere with the investigation, but then again to raise money off of his interference. I think that this is completely unethical. I hope that the Robert Mueller investigation and his team is looking into whether or not uh, Devin Nunes has, number one, violated his oath of office, uh, but number two, uh, gone beyond his scope as a committee chairman uh, and really worked to obstruct justice in this circumstance. And so I think that there is nobody else in Washington that stands closer to Donald Trump in trying to uh, protect him from what he may have done in 2016. And so I think that this is why this, this election is so important for folks, not only in our district, but for people that live all across the country. And this is why we've seen an overwhelming uh, amount of financial support and we hope that that continues because we need to make sure that Devin Nunes is no longer the committee chairman come uh, 2019. And you're a prosecutor, so what are your thoughts on how, if the how, if the Democrats take the House in 2018, they should proceed with the Russia investigation going into 2019? You know, I've been very clear on this issue. Um, I've been asked this question given my background as a as a local prosecutor. 
Um, you know, my position is that we need to make sure that that Robert Mueller is allowed to finish his investigation before the House of Representatives uh, takes any type of action. Uh, I think it plays into Trump's hands for us to begin talking about impeachment at this early stage, because we see every single day what he's trying to do is to give this investigation a partisan political taint. And we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if we begin to talk about impeachment before all of the facts are in and before the investigation is completed, uh, it really goes to Trump's message that this is a partisan witch hunt and we can't let that happen. And so we need to do everything that we can in the House of Representatives to protect the integrity of this administration. I'm sorry, this uh, integrity of this investigation. And if I get elected to Congress, that's what I'm going to do. So one more question about the Russia stuff. <laughs> I, I spoke with your fellow Democrat, uh, California Democrat Harley Ruda about this and s pointed out that there's kind of a debate amongst Democrats right now about how much attention should be focused on the Russian story and the corruption during this campaign and how much should be focused on kitchen table issues like jobs and health care. Um, where do you fall on this? How, how should Democrats strike a balance between those two kinds of issues in this campaign season? You know, I can tell you that uh, having been in this race for nearly a year and a half now, um, people care more about these bread and butter issues that you had mentioned, uh, jobs and the economy, education. Uh, here in the Central Valley, we have 60% uh, of the folks that live in my district who are on some form of government assistance. We rank very high when it comes to poverty. Our school districts rank very low when it comes to uh, quality of education. And so there are really pressing issues here in the Central Valley that the voters want me to focus on. Uh, so my focus uh, in district is to make sure that I continue to talk about these issues, let people know that I'm here to protect things like Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, but I don't think that we can leave uh, the issue of Nunes's involvement with trying to cover up for the Trump administration alone. I think that this issue uh, has national implications. And part of the reason why we need to make sure that, that Nunes is held accountable, I think it goes to his character. It goes to his character as a member of Congress. He is one of the most powerful uh, men in the United States Congress. And so he raises a lot of money and he has a lot of political capital. So my question to voters here in the district is, what is he spending his power and political capital on? It's not us, it's not the folks back at home. You know, we have uh, major infrastructure issues in California's Central Valley. Transportation and water projects are in uh, dire need here. And so instead of going out and pushing for some of these projects, he's pushing his own political agenda, trying to move up the ladder and maybe earn a spot in uh, this Trump administration. So I think that that's important to talk about. But you're right. At the end of the day, uh, voters really want to know what I'm going to do for them. And so I'm going to be out there and I'm going to continue to talk about the issues that they care about. You've been really hammering Nunes uh, for on your Twitter account and elsewhere for spending more time in D.C. and not very much time in the district. Um, while you've been out there hitting the pavement. Can you tell me more about, about this criticism and why you think it's important? Yeah, and it's not only spending time in D.C. You know, we understand that members of Congress have to go to D.C. to do their job. But we didn't send Nunes to Washington to go to basketball games, to spend large sums of money on private jets, limousines, trips to wineries, trips to Vegas. He's not doing the job of the people back home. And so I think that it's very important that the voters in my district are educated on what Nunes is doing when he's not in Washington. You know, we're in August recess right now and he's been nowhere to be found. Uh, he popped up on the map somewhere in uh, Central Asia, Azerbaijan, uh, instead of being out in the district. And we have no idea what he's doing out there. He's not the secretary of state. He's not even the deputy uh, secretary of state. So we don't know why he's out there uh, except to sort of promote his own agenda and advance his own political career. So to me, it's important that we bring attention to this issue. If I get sent to Washington, I'm gonna work and fight every single day for the voters that live in my district. And I think that is what voters want and that's what they deserve. It's an interesting question because, you know, everyone believes a blue wave is kind of coming in November. Why do you think he's not interested in showing back up home and doing more campaign elbow grease work? You know, that's a, that's an interesting question. We've been trying to figure this out ourselves. Uh, you know, I think it might have to do with the fact that that he's won his uh, elections in the past by large margins, by 30, uh, uh, sometimes 35 points. And reason being is that the National Democratic Party 
hasn't put much resources or effort into this region to make sure that this can become a democratic stronghold. Uh, this is a region that should be voting for Democrats. I talked a little bit earlier about uh, the the level of inequality here, the lack of opportunity. Medium, uh, median income here in the Central Valley is around $50,000. So people are barely making ends meet. And so folks have consistently been voting against their own economic interests. And so I think now for the first time, and me being in this campaign, we've been able to have a viable, coherent message and strategy uh, in the Central Valley. And this is something that Nunes is very unaccustomed to. And I think that in his mind, uh, given his ego, he's going to walk away with this election without having to try very hard. And so I think come November 6th, he's going to be very surprised. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew. My guest today has been Andrew Jans. He is running uh, for the House of Representatives in California's 2020, uh, 22nd District. Thank you again, Andrew. Thank you, Amanda. Take care.